Good evening and uh, thank you very much for taking the trouble to come all this way to listen to. I was referred to as the expert, I'm not. I'm just trying to learn more and more about it because the whole business of the Islamic State is actually like a moving target. Constantly there's something or the other happening, um, whether it's something to do with ISIS in some country or the other, or whether it's something to do with ISIS in the area where they are operating, which is Syria and Iraq. So I um, thought that I'd talk a little bit about the genesis of ISIS, what it is, what is happening, where did it come from, what are it, what, how has it grown, what are its attributes, what is the kind of anti-ISIS strategy that uh, presently is being employed and what I think should be done, and most importantly, what are its implications for India. And from that, what are the general options that we have to deal with this group and secondly what are the gen uh, what are the options that india has to deal with it because in my view to caps encapsulate my point first that the whole business of isis or islamic state which grew from ISI to ISIS, oblique ISIL, I'll explain all these acronyms, and to IS. Uh, it is, in my view, at the heart of it, a problem within Islam. It is because all religions have extreme interpretations of those religions. You have extreme people in every religion who may even be um, committed to violence to enforce their point of view. And in the end, if you actually go down to it, that's what ISIS is. They have a conception of that religion which is quite, quite different and quite against the mainstream perception of that religion. But nevertheless, they have it. And... Uh, why have they succeeded? I'll get to that. Second is that I am not calling it Islamic State for the simple reason that the Islamic State was, I mean, was proclaimed by the head of ISIS, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, whose name actually is Badri. And he was an, a soldier in Saddam Hussein's army he was, he is in, in his original name on the global terrorist list of the United States. There's a $10 million bounty on his head. At the same time, he was presented to Senator McCain in February 2013 in Erbil, that is in Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan, as a moderate Sunni. And this is what he has created and having succeeded militarily to occupy five provinces, three of them in Iraq and two contiguous provinces in Syria, he has now arrogated to himself the, uh, the idea that this, is, this group should now be called the Islamic State or the Islamic Caliphate and he's called the Caliph to show that, to kind of assert the sovereign, his sovereignty over all the Muslims of the world, which nobody accepts. So that is the why I keep calling it ISIS and I don't call it IS. So that's just by way of background. Now, let, I think we got the maps, yeah. Uh, let's start with this map, sorry. Uh, there should be one more map. I don't know where it's gone. Anyway, um, what I wanted to say is just see what this group has done in the last, uh, I should say, six months or thereabouts. This, as well as here in Derezor, Raqqa, parts of Aleppo, and even actually parts, uh, some parts of Damascus. Um, actually, you will get a better operation. So these are the, I mean, this tells you the ISIS attack zones, which are in these colors. 
the, um, these are the support zones. So this is a more detailed map of where they have their bases. And uh, Kobani, which you've been hearing a lot of, is somewhere here, uh, over here. Um, So first, let me just go, why are Syria and Iraq important? What's the, what's the importance of these countries? Firstly, this is the Mesopotamian basin where you have the roots of the civilization which grew up in Mesopotamia, where the three religions that we know, uh, we might call them Western religions or Eastern religions, depending on what your point of view is, but Islam, Judaism, and Christianity have all grown there. Uh, Syria itself, sits astride three big civilizations, the Arab, the Turkic, and the Persian. So it has always been actually a battleground for Islam, for a number of religions, but for the same reason, it has also had a certain uh, tradition of tolerance, of at least acceptance. That is why you have, on the one hand, the Church of Adanias in Damascus, which is a 4 AD, where uh, Saul, who became Paul, saw the light. On the other hand, you have a number of, you have at least 26 Shia shrines in uh, Damascus, in, around, in and around Damascus or in Syria. Um, so therefore, it has always been a region of great religious ferment. Syria itself, in political terms, is a pivotal state because what happens in Syria actually has an effect all across the region. And it's no wonder, therefore, that the Syrians call themselves, at least used to call themselves, the bleeding heart of the Arab world because that's where all the agony of the Arabs, especially in relation to the Jews or in relation to Israel, is supposed to come out. And uh, it has definitely influenced religion politics, society in that part of the region. And in many ways, you will see that over long times, Syrian, uh, I mean, it is a country where minorities have flourished, despite even during Islamic times. The other important reason for Syria is that it confronts Israel directly because of the Golan, part of which is occupied. Iraq, the same story. It, it has the two shrine cities of Najaf and Karbala, and that goes back to the origin of Islam itself. So this whole area, as far as Islam is concerned, has had seen tremendous strife, and it's no wonder that what is happening right now is also happening there. In other terms, Iraq, of course, is one of the largest uh, suppliers of oil to the world, which was disrupted, but has been uh, has restarted again, but now with what's happening in the north, north part of Iraq or in Kurdistan, there is a certain disruption of that oil as well. But nevertheless, the Iraqis are fond of saying that if there are three barrels of oil left in the world, two will be Iraqi. True or false, it just, it, it just sort of illustrates what a huge stock of oil they are sitting on and the, what, how important it has always been in recent times, uh, certainly from the 50s, after the nationalization of oil companies in determining Iraq's policy. Saddam Hussein, when I was there, made oil his chief weapon in deciding how much to allot different countries depending on how friendly they were to his regime. And uh, of course, he used the oil coupons during the oil for food program between 96 and 2000 uh, where a lot of important people seem to have got those benefits, including some in India, who will remain nameless, of course. So what is the Islamic State? So as I said, in my view, it is the manifestation of a long-standing struggle which in, within Islam, which is as old as Islam itself. Because in the end, it is a question of who actually uh, prevails. In present times, this whole thing resurfaced after the U.S. invasion of Iraq, which created polities in these, in, especially in Iraq and then in Syria, not yet in Iran, 
which were completely wrecked as far as their existing structure was concerned, which actually opened the Pandora's box of who was a Shia, who was a Sunni. It's not that people didn't know, but it just became totally uh, open in the sense the Americans started looking at it only in these terms. And then they went on to talk of Sunni crescents and Shia crescents and all that kind of thing. So the whole thing got divided, not in the way it was. If anything, before all this, despite the division between the Shias and the Sunnis, the real animosities, if such things did exist in Iraq, was not so much to the Shia or the Sunni, but to the Persian. There are old story books of uh, Iraqi story books um, of Hassan of Basra. They have been translated in English also, where all these story books are really meant to uh, put little children to sleep. And all of them are children's stories, but all of them end with saying, now go to sleep, otherwise that wily Persian will come across. You know, something like that. So the Persian is the big uh, bogeyman, more or less. So those were the kind of things, not, there was not as, I mean, there was definitely ferment religion-wise, but it was not overt. Now, how did it, how did ISIS start? It started, it was started actually by the prisoners from the U.S. And basically, it was start, okay. Let the first step was the debathification order that Mr. Bremer, who was the more or less the U.S. viceroy in uh, Iraq, did immediately after taking over, which effectively overnight uh, put almost every Iraqi out of job because Iraq's state was the largest employer and. Uh, it was necessary to become a member of the Ba'ath Party if you were actually going to get anywhere. So by saying that all those who are Ba'athis should not come to work the next day, a lot of people just fell, saw, and this applied to the army. So a lot of arm, Iraqi army people were jobless, armed, and eventually ready to start an insurgency against the American troops. So it started as an anti-American insurgency composed of uh, demobbed soldiers or de soldiers or others who had been sprung from jails, all that kind of thing. That was the kind of nucleus that started off basically an insurgency against U.S. forces when they were in occupation of Iraq. Once the occupation of uh, Iraq ended in December 2011, that's when this militant opposition again didn't have anything to do. Much like the Mujahideen in Afghanistan after the U.S. withdrew from there and we found themselves actually, we found them creating infiltration and terrorism in Kashmir. It was more or less these unemployed armed people and there's no shortage of arms in Iraq and probably now not in Syria also these days. So. Um, these were the people who actually found that uh, that they were being marginalized. I mean, basically what happened was you had democratic elections in Iraq, the first one in 2005, and where, the, uh, where Mr. Nouri al-Malki became prime minister. But what was important was that for the first time, there was a correction of the population balance in Iraq. Because Saddam Hussein and his coterie of Sunnis were ruling a majority Shia population, which was it is estimated between 60 to 65 percent. So that size of the population was totally oppressed during the Saddam Hussein years. And the Malki election actually corrected this, at which time the Sunnis of uh, Syria, who also of Iraq, who did not also come from the oil-rich zones, found themselves without anything to do in the sense there was no opening left for them. And that marginalization of the Sunnis continued during the 10 years that Mr. Malki was prime minister and increasingly becoming more or less, uh, you know, that it became kind of payback time 
for the Sunnis for having done all that they had done for the last 40 years before that. Mr. Malki forgot that having been elected, I would say the second time, in spite of very uh, difficult conditions, having been elected democratically, he had an obligation to carry different parts of the Iraqi society with him. He was not even interested in doing it. So that really is what spurred this militant opposition to take up arms against the militias, the Shia militias and the Iraqi army to protect their interests. So that, and then they affiliated themselves with the Al-Qaeda, which was anyway active in Afghanistan and elsewhere. So they called themselves the Islamic State of Iraq and decided that there, it is going to be a, a, a totally religious entity. Now, what was happening parallelly in Syria at the same time? Firstly, when, after the U.S. invasion, uh, Hafiz Assad, who, oh no, Hafiz Assad had died in 2000. Yes, I think so. Bashar Assad found that with the, he had really, he had literally Americans as his neighbors. And that was a very uncomfortable situation to be in. So he started actually encouraging this uh, insurgent group, supporting them in order that they could actually wage insurgency against the American troops in Iraq. So in that sense, Mr. Assad is, can, is not blameless in how this ISIS started. Anyway, when th that continued to happen, but meanwhile, after 2011, when this group started gaining tremendous military advantage and territory, until they threatened almost Baghdad in 2013, and they threatened Kurdistan in 2013, 2014, they were more or less made to, I mean, they agreed probably to have, make a common cause with the different insurgent groups, because what was happening in Syria was that Western powers, especially France, United Kingdom, supported by certain important regional powers in West Asia, particularly Saudi Arabia, with its funds and its Wahhabi ethic, the Qataris with their funds and the Turks. They, with the French and the British, were supporting different splinter groups opposition groups, militant opposition groups against the Assad regime to topple that regime. They were all Sunni groups. But now it's four years, they haven't succeeded. So it, the face of that, about a year back I should say, the ISIS made common cause with some of these groups, not all of them, because they're totally fractious and they sometimes even fight with each other. So, having made common cause with these groups, they then call themselves the Islamic State in the Levant. Levant is the French expression of that region, which includes Lebanon, Syria, basically Lebanon and Syria, and or alternately, Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. And then having conquered or let's say having captured or gained control over nearly 40% of the territory of those two countries, Mr. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, whose name is Awad Ibrahim al-Badri, decided to declare his organization as an Islamic State. Now, it now includes cadres, army cadres, from the three worst prisons that the U.S. has had. Abu Ghraib, you heard of. There's Camp Cropper and then there's one more. So these prisons provided, uh, sooner or later, a lot of those people in those prisons were let go, especially after the Americans had withdrawn from there. So this is the, uh, this is how this organization has grown. But it is very different from all the different Sunni opposition organizations that you find in Syria, which have a large number of names because militarily they are extremely well organized, having been soldiers of the Iraqi army for a long time. As an army, they didn't perform very well, but certainly as soldiers, 
banded together because of this particular idea of imposing Islamic law or is Sharia in the area that they have captured, they have certainly done pretty well. So they have now the Iraq control over the Iraqi provinces of Musal, Nineveh, Anbar, and the contiguous provinces of Raqqa and Deir Azur. In so doing, of course, they have on the way destroyed a large number of uh, um, old antiquities, old uh, artifacts have been looted, and they're getting a cut out of it. They are unlike the Taliban who destroyed the Bamiyan Buddhas and without, uh, only because of their Islamic fanaticism. Here the ISIS has been actually getting uh, farming out to different contractors, the looting of tremendous sites like the one at Apame and all these thing, uh, places in Aleppo Museum, in Raqqa, all the um, museum and all the Islamic uh, um, architecture, no, Islamic pottery and so on is gone. It's available somewhere or the other, but uh, they have been getting cuts. That's one of their sources of revenue. So what, uh, what is ISIS then? It is the cause for and the effect of three parallel divides that have developed in West Asia. The first, as I have talked at length, is about the Shia and the Sunni divide, which was exposed after the U.S., uh, especially after the U.S. invasion of 2003. Second is the divide which is there between the supporters of political Islam as in embodied or as uh, seen from the Muslim Brotherhood. You have uh, on the one hand countries which support it, like Turkey or Saudi Arabia and others who oppose it. Now actually even Saudi Arabia opposes it. Egypt is where the Muslim Brotherhood came back to power and properly through a free and fair election two years ago and Mr. Mohamed Mursi became the president of Egypt. But within less than six months, the same people who elected him by almost 75% of the vote got him out because he was trying to convert Egypt into an Islamic state. Now, the, polit the Muslim Brotherhood first started, or its origin can be dated to 1928 when it was started by Hassan al-Banna, uh, an Egyptian. And uh, during the 70s, the Muslim Brotherhood was quite prolific, but actually got hammered out of existence in many of these countries where they were becoming, pro especially in Syria. You all must have heard of what Hafiz Assad did in 1982 at Hama where he is the first time that any such thing happened, which was uh, the Syrian army surrounded Hama, which was the center of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Syrian Air Force bombed that city out of existence. And it didn't matter who died. And part of that ruined city was kept as it is. The whole of the city has been built. It's a beautiful city on the Orontes River. But they kept part of those ruins just to teach a lesson to the Muslim Brotherhood never to raise its head again. So the Muslim, it's not as if therefore the Muslim Brotherhood died. It just entered a quietest phase. Its networks were intact. Everything was fine. And they were waiting for an opportunity. That opportunity essentially came when the Arab Spring started and you had all these popular demonstrations from, um, let's say, Tunisia all the way to Syria. Those popular demonstrations when they started uh, were really genuinely spontaneous, guided by the youth, interested in having their voice heard in uh, the governance of these countries because of the large number of years when they had been oppressed not allow, I mean, things like the right of assembly just doesn't exist in these countries. Four people get together, you might go to jail. So uh, this was a popular protest. For the first six months, you did not find the Muslim Brotherhood doing anything or any of the other entrenched forces. But after six months, when they found that it was not possible for the existing autocrats to put down these 
protests, that's when the Muslim Brotherhood got in and obviously because they had better organization, were able to win the elections. The Muslim Brotherhood got 50% of the vote and the more extreme um, uh, Muslim parties in Egypt got 25% more. So together they had 75%. So this is the second divide that still exists and uh, the Saudis now oppose it. And one of the reasons they're given huge financial subventions to, uh, to uh, President Sisi, formerly the head of the army, which was restored back to power, the people couldn't find no one else who could do this, and uh, is to keep the Muslim Brotherhood in jail, their leaders. Again, so, but the thing starts. The third is, of course, that the revolutionary protests, which, which is what I, which is what I call the misnamed Arab Spring against the autocratic rulers still continues. What has happened is that there has been a blowback by entrenched forces, which, that is the forces which were with the autocrats. The most classic example of which is what the Syrian regime did to the protests in the first protest in March 2011 in Dara on the Jordan-Syria border. There, they took such a violent line against very spontaneous protest that what happened was bound to happen. So, um, so these are the three um, divides that actually characterize West Asia today. But it's also interesting to note that all this has happened in the only true countries in, the, in West Asia or in the Arab world which did not have, which were not Islamic states which had adopted the secular credo of the Arab Baath Socialist Party, as the ABSP, Iraq and Syria, as the only two countries. And having been posted in both countries, I can say that they were, there was a class difference between these countries and the others in terms of, firstly, their commitment to the divorce between the authority of state and the religious authority. Second, their ability to, um, to promote women's empowerment. These were the only countries where wearing a hijab was not necessary. Women could work in offices, all these kind of things. And there were many other things. The main credo of the Arab Baath Socialist Party was uh, unity, uh, unity, Arab unity, Arab solidarity, and socialism, because those were the days when socialism was the ruling sort of uh, economic credo. Actually, socialism didn't succeed. Arab solidarity has not happened. Arab unity, less talked about it, the better. But uh, anyway, what, what the credos that the Arab Baath Socialist parties established both in Iraq and Syria have slowly gone out the door thanks to the fact that both leaders, whether it was Saddam Hussein or Hafez Assad, realized, and this also after the first Gulf War and the interest that the Arabs had, uh, that the United States had in actually keeping a hand in, that they would, in spite of the injunction that they had accepted of the, of the Arab Baath Socialist uh, ideology to keep religion and the authority of state separate, they would have to do something to cater to the Islamic tendencies in amongst its population because the fact remains that there is a strong Islamic bent in all, all these countries. So slowly they started opening up the public space to, to clerics and eventually even the political space. So this was the development taking place which encouraged these different groups to actually slowly gain not just political advantage but they had the military possibility and that the combination of these factors at the same time actually has created what we call ISIS today. Just once again to emphasize that, the, that, to, that, they, there are, that part of it is also due to the reverse sectarian ratios in Iraq and Syria. Whereas in Iraq you had a Sunni minority ruling a Shia majority, in, in Syria you have a Shia minority ruling a Sunni majority. So these tensions have always been there. It's not they haven't been there. But now what are the ISIS's attributes? 
as I said, it, different estimates are there, but they control about 40% of the territory. The borders established by the Sykes-Pico Agreement of 1916 presently stand at least obliterated to the extent of those five this thing. There is an assiduous attempt by the Islamic State to build the attributes of a nation state. They have actually co-opted all the administrative functioning, you know, functionaries at different levels in the areas where they are. They are saying, look, we'll pay you, you continue doing the work, but this is how you do it. In schools, they have taken steps to actually cut out certain kind of teaching and include Islamic teaching. Even in the University of Baghdad, certain courses, especially on uh, which are more liberal, have all been stopped. That's the reported thing. They have built a treasury. They say that they have about $2 billion in their treasury, which basically the revenue comes from the sale of oil, which they have plundered. All the oil that wells that they have got, they have been selling the oil also to the Syrian government, interestingly, because all kinds of deals are done, you know, within that thing. Uh, then, of course, from the plunder and sale of antiquities, then whatever rental those states used to get from government buildings there, ransoms is another big amount. And, of course, there are, there's monies flowing in from the backers of ISIS who are slowly withdrawing for the fear that they might now find the ISIS looking at them. They have been getting financial and other sub subventions from certain regional countries also. Um, the most important thing that they have done is they have been very effectively able to use social networking sites, especially YouTube and uh, Facebook and Twitter, to pr convey their message, to convey their ideology, and surprisingly, there's a tremendous amount of attraction that, a attraction that they have found not just in Muslim countries, but also in non-Muslim countries, um, including in the West. So they are using a lot of these young people, let's say, who might come from France. France has a number of those who have gone and joined ISIS, and using them to make their broadcast so that everything is being done in the same language. It's an, and they have an online journal called Dabik, D-A-B-I-Q. It's actually a small village in Syria, which is the sign of, which is actually supposed to be where the last battle will be fought, according to, to the Quran. So Dabik, that's why they call it. And you can actually, and Dabik is available in English also, so you can actually do a Google search and see the kind of stuff they put out. So, um, that's just a brief... I mean, sort of an introduction to what it is. I think what concerns us is what is the implication of all this to India? We have, I don't have to uh, repeat it, but we have the third largest or the second largest, depending on where you look at it, let's say the second largest Muslim community in the world. We have not so far had uh, any of this kind of a thing penetrating. But in my view, actually, the ISIS and its ideology represents a threat to all composite and plural societies. And I do not know of any, I know of some, but most countries today that we keep talking about are all plural societies, are composite societies, they have people of different religions, including countries like the United States or, the, or Europe. Europe is presently having a problem with this, and I think this whole Charlie Hebdo business was a manifestation of the same thing. So for us in India, I think we should be aware that it is, that it represents a threat at various levels, political, social, and economic. Its ideology really is anathema as far as India's civilization and culture of tolerance is concerned, our culture of compromise, and our secular ethos. Politically, the attraction of ISIS's ideology reflects not only the widespread frustration with existing governments in the Islamic countries, but also in the West, but also other plural democratic societies. In India, there is a strong perception, as you know, that the Indian Muslim community has not got its fair share of the benefits of economic growth and development. And this is exacerbated, firstly, by the youth bulge in, the po in our population, and secondly, 
by the frustration with secular political parties and the vote bank politics that they have pursued all these years. So the unrealized aspirations and the ineptitude of mainstream political parties to address them have for the first time turned these youth towards supporting political parties contesting on a religious platform, as you've seen here in Bombay itself. Uh, and don't think this is a flash in the pan. This could be the beginning of a different kind of a situation in India. This suggests an unwelcome polarization of populations along religious lines, a trend that may see radicalization of sections of our young population. The widespread dis diffusion of ISIS's message to Muslim youth in India and world over effectively using social networking sites, as I said, has been an important phenomena. You have read of the arrest of, uh, what's his name, Mehdi Masroor Bishwas, who was actually uh, sort of uh, handling the Twitter site of ISIS under his hashtag called at Shami Witness. And he had 127 tweets and 17,000 followers. Now that's a large number for somebody. So it is reported that two, two, uh, it is reported that his tweets were followed by two thirds of the foreign fighters of ISIS. This is another thing. Most countries now are looking at the return of these so-called nationals who actually fought for ISIS. We have had four, and we have one of them who is now in one of our jails in Pihar. Sorry, here in Arthur Road. Uh, so. The Americans have made a study and put out a report that they are anticipating 3,000 American nationals who worked with ISIS who will return and they don't know what these people are going to do. These are U.S. nationals and uh, they anticipate the worst, I should say. So for us, there's another problem. The existence of homegrown, Pakistan-supported terrorist groups like the Indian Mujahideen, IM, which has been responsible for some terrorist attacks, and SIMI, the Student Islamic Movement of India, has already negated firstly our belief. We used to say until this happened that in spite of all the growth of Al-Qaeda from 19, I mean from the late 90s after Taliban reversal there, that there is not a single Indian that you can point who is there. I don't think we can say that anymore. Uh, the recent uh, announcement again by Aman al-Jawahiri of Al-Qaeda that they have opened a branch called the Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent is a sign of the times. And the last thing we would want is that the Al-Qaeda in the subcontinent becomes a battleground for ISIS wanting to get in and uses this as a fertile ground. So, I mean, I'm not saying this is going to happen. I'm just alerting you or trying to tell you the dangers if nothing is done. And what has to be done is to be both constructive and, of course, uh, to deal with it in other ways. So all these organizations, certainly these two and others which may, you know, are susceptible to ISIS's ideology, influence and support. Now, there are reports, and there's just a little bit more detail in case you're interested. The, there are reports, of course, and some of you must have seen it, there are reports of the ISIS flags being seen in Kashmir. There's a Sri Lankan operative of ISIS who was arrested in Chennai. A Jamaatul Mujahideen Bangladeshi terror module was functioning from Bardwan in West Bengal. A school website in Delhi and a well-known school, I will not, men I'm not mentioning the name, was defaced and the principal of the school threatened in Delhi and the arrest of three youth, again by the ISIS-related groups, the arrest of three youth in Bhopal with alleged links to this man, Mehdi Masroor Bishwas. These are signs that ISIS has started making roads into India, inroads into India. Equally disturbing are reports that Indian youth from Kalyan, Nashik, Mumbai may have joined ISIS, which you know one of them has been killed. And on the other hand, you have reports of recruiting agencies in Lucknow, recruiting Shias to go and fight to defend the shrine cities of Najaf and Karbala against the ISIS in Iraq. All these are reports, so I can't say that they are 100% true, but if there are reports, 
let's say even 25 percent they are true, it's a matter of some concern. Although figures of Indian youth involved with ISIS are not clear, reports suggest that their numbers could be in hundreds, including youth recruited among the Indian diaspora in the Gulf. So if somebody gets recruited from there, and as you know, we have between three and five million Indians working in the Gulf, uh, I think a couple of million are in Saudi Arabia. If somebody gets recruited, you wouldn't even know that something like this has happened. Um, then the return under custody, of course, of RF Majid, currently in jail under Section 16, 18, and 20 of our Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, because, by the way, that's the only act we have, and we have banned ISIS under that act, the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. I don't know what kind of teeth it has, uh, the danger of such returning ISIS fighters of their own volition to India without the knowledge of the state authorities is something that we need to think about. What we have done so far is actually uh, we have banned, of course, the ISIS. We, see, we have banned 32 websites, ISIS and ISIS-related jihadi websites, which aim to recruit young people. Now, what should we do? I'll get to that shortly. Economically, there has been a disruption of oil supplies from uh, the oil fields in Iraq and also, of course, Syria was not a great contributor, but certainly from the Kurdish fields in Iraq. Luckily for us, for other reasons, the Americans have persuaded the Saudis, who have always been a reserve supplier of oil, to pump more oil the reason there, of course, is that they want to bankrupt the Iranian and the um, Russian economies. There are already American sanctions on Iran, there are American sanctions on Russia, there are American sanctions on Russian persons. Hmm? Yeah. Venezuela? So, this. Uh, Venezuela is also contributing. The point is that they have been able to ensure that the disruption caused by ISIS does not lead to an increase in the oil price, in fact, to depress the oil price. And as you know, in the last uh, couple of months, I think the oil price has been hovering between 47 and 50 dollars. It's extremely good for countries like us. The longer it remains uh, at that level, the more we can say that our fight against inflation is succeeding. But uh, it's not a long-term solution. So um, I've already dealt with this. So what, what are our possible options? As I said, we, I've already told you the actions that we have taken. I think it's extremely important to identify the channels and methods of indoctrination. And we need to have some kind of a collaboration between our agencies on the returning jihadi <coughs> adherents who might be coming back to India, whom we do not know went there in the first place. So which means that we need intelligence cooperation with some countries in the Gulf, with the United States, with Turkey and Syria and Saudi Arabia, because that would be a useful input. We also need political cooperation, or we always have it, but we need far greater political cooperation with one particular objective, which is that how do you secure the large number of Indians who work in the Gulf. Because as all that's happening in Syria comes down to the Gulf, and it could, possibly, all it needs is a, is a fear of, um, of something like this happening, and you will start getting people wanting to get out of there. We have already evacuated in thousands, twice, from Beirut, Indians who were working there. We evacuated, I think, around 17,000 odd people from Libya. So we keep doing this. How are you going to evacuate more than a million people from Saudi Arabia? What is the option? You can't make a land bridge or an air bridge. We're not capable of it. So we might have to think of some other way. There's only one other way. But all this needs to be thought through because rather than caught napping, the other thing is that the disruption of oil supplies has not affected us right now, but if it does, we need to have other ways of securing our needs because as the economy revs up, as 
the government says it will, you're going to need more and more oil, more and more petrochemicals, and we're going to have to find where to buy it from. At the same time, we have investments in the region, in the oil sector. We have Indian companies which have contracts in the Iraqi Kurdistan where this disruption has taken place. We have uh, an Indian company which owns actually, I think, the oil field that is presently under ISIS control in Syria. We have um, um, an investment in the Greater Nile oil project in Sudan where the Sudan civil war has affected, I mean, no production is taking place. So we have large investments taking, uh, there which we need to see how we are going to secure all this. In a general sense, what can be the anti-ISIS strategy? For the moment, it is, as Radha said, there is some success being achieved by the military actions that are being taken against ISIS through US drone attacks and this, that and the other. But if my point is to be carried forward, that if it is indeed a struggle within Islam at the heart of it, if it is something you cannot actually destroy, you might be able to marginalize it by getting the majority with you, which is what has happened in most cases. But how do you kill an idea? You can't. So you need to have an IC strategy which has a military, a political, and an ideological dimension. The second most important thing is you need cohesive action on this because right now those who are actually trying to fight ISIS have divided goals. Uh, do you get Assad out or do you get ISIS and do you destroy ISIS? They're stuck in this. Some say this, others say that. And uh, their predilections, of course, and their positions determine their, uh, how they act and whom they support. So there are conflict instances of the United States, US, France, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, exactly. The other thing is that so far the organization of Islamic cooperation which has been put, set to, put together to actually promote the correct face of that religion, which took a great initiative after 9-11 to try to project Islam as really what it is, that is a, a religion of peace. Now the OIC has made very few statements on what is going on. But what is needed, because if this is a problem which stems from within Islam, then it is for the Islamic cooperation organization to actually get, take the primary role in this. People like us can only help. The primary role has to be taken by them, which is not happening. So you need countries, important countries like Saudi Arabia, like Iran, like Turkey, like Pakistan, Nigeria, Morocco, other Gulf countries to sit together and see how this is to be dealt with. We also need a much greater agreement in the United Nations Security Council and a new initiative on Syria. I heard that there is a new initiative on Syria which the Russians have again proposed, which the Americans are uh, supporting. I have, don't have too much information about it. I've also heard that some back-channel talks between the Assad regime and the US administration have also started. Now, I, I'm saying I've heard because these are, I would like to say that these are from usually reliable sources, but I can't go beyond that. Um, but more important and above everything, one has to say that we have to, in plural and composite societies, we have to see how you address this problem of frustration and deprivation on the part of the Muslim communities in our societies. Thank you very much.